All right, welcome to 5 p.m. in track two with Corey Wolf, Move in Silence, Staying Quiet in Mature Networks. Uh, Corey's a red team leader and a hacker with decades of experience in IT, though you wouldn't know it by looking at the young fella, and, and development as well. He's been building and breaking all the things since his first computer in 1988, and is probably still reading the Hacker's Manifesto. He holds the Offensive Security Certified Professional, the OSCP, and a CISSP certification, and can be found tending to his farm when he's not wired in. Good, Another good example of hobbies that don't involve a keyboard. Yeah, it's, it's good to have those. It's good to have those. Thanks for the intro. Yeah, so I like, to, I like that you say that I look young. It makes me feel good because every day I feel like I'm getting older, but the decades of experience does come from um, like we mentioned there, I got my first computer when I was pretty young. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on myself, uh, but just a quick overview. Uh, BB gave me a, a great intro there. Uh, first computer in 88 when I was four years old. Uh, my old man had the foresight to know that the PC was going to be big. Uh, I got our first computer back when I was four. Uh, been involved ever since. Worked, uh, been a developer, worked in security, built mobile apps, all that good stuff. Um, I am the practice manager of offensive security at a company called Larry Security. We're based in Philadelphia. Um, and there's some links for you. So if you have any questions about me or want to know more, uh, feel free to, to do that, to visit those links. <clears throat> all right, so you know, I just want to set some ex expectations for today. Uh, so, you know, the title, you know, Moving in Silence is actually, I think it's Nas. Uh, is uh, really just about um, what we're going to talk about today is not fancy EDR techniques. We're not going to talk about bypassing EDR with uh, C sharp and rehooking DLLs or doing anything crazy like that. Um, it's really not that exciting, unfortunately. What we're going to talk about today um, is really getting back to basics, right? Um, we're going to talk about methodology that I use and my team uses on, on every engagement um, that can be used to fly under the radar uh, and essentially stay quiet and evade detection. Uh, we're really going to talk about doing basic things in a quiet manner. Um, some of these things you're going to say, yeah, of course I can do that. Why would I want to do that? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that throughout all of the next 48 minutes or so, uh, the point is, is to remain quiet. So we don't want to use Nmap. We don't want to use things like Rumble. We don't want to just start banging away at the network, right? Because what we're talking about here today is um, operating in mature environments. So we're talking about environments that have already gone through thousands of pen tests. We're talking about environments that have IR teams. Uh, we're talking about environments that have socks, have SIMs. And we simply just can't go in there and just start hammering away, right? So this isn't the, the flashy stuff of, you know, unhooking EDR and, and doing all this crazy stuff with C Sharp and, you know, talking about the common language runtime and all these other things that, that happened today, which have their place uh, and I enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, but what we're really talking about today uh, is, is working in a mature environment. Uh, this is pretty much everything <laughs> that I just said. Uh, one thing I would note is I'm always interested in hearing other ways uh, to, you know, um, remain quiet and, and alternative ways to do things. Um, again, everything we talk about today is getting back to basics, using the tools at our disposal, using uh, law bins. Uh, to accomplish the same tasks that we would use Nmap for or some kind of vulnerability scanner, Rumble, whatever it might be. Um, that's, what, that's what we're going to talk about. So, in, in a little bit, you'll see I'm going to share kind of a methodology, methodology that I use and that my team uses. Uh, but when we go into one of these, these penetration tests, there's essentially a couple of questions that we want to start off with, right? So we want to know where is ADC? You know, when we're talking about large environments, of course, there could be more than one. 
right? But we want to find at least one uh, domain controller. Uh, we want to look in footprint the network and say, okay, where's the server VLAN? Or where's the server subnet? How can we find this, right? Uh, we also want to look and see, are there other important subnets? For example, is there a management VLAN? Uh, are there situ or switches sitting somewhere? Uh, where's the firewall? You know, we want to know these things. We want to figure these things out. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the other big ones is, where are most of the clients located? So in mature environments and big enterprise environments, well, in mature environments, everything's segmented, right? Uh, so they have a certain VLAN just for clients. They have a certain VLAN just for VPN. Um, they have it all segmented um, appropriately, which is good network architecture, really. Um, and it's good security architecture. Uh, one of the other things that we like to look at and, and kind of find out is, is Active Directory Certificate Services in use. So we like to look at that because there's been a lot of work done, and I can't remember their names right now, but in the past year or so, there's been a lot of work done about Active Directory Certificate Services, uh, how to exploit it. There's one particular exploit where it, it puts together a petite podium um, to query the DC, then you use NTLM Relay X to then um, relay to uh, the domain controller, uh, grab a certificate. But the point is, is that that's one of the primary questions that we want to ask because there's a lot of stuff that you can do with, with uh, certificate services, uh, a lot of ways to potentially exploit it. So th those are one of the big, uh, th those are really the big questions that we're asking. <clears throat> so here's a common workflow. Uh, so whenever we start an engagement, uh, we look and we say, well, where am I, right? What's around me? What can I see? Um, am I, again, am I on a client VLAN? Am I on a server subnet? Where am I? Next question we want to ask is where is the domain controller or a domain controller? Again, in large environments, there's usually more than one. Uh, the next big question we want to ask is where are the member servers? So where are the uh, MS SQL servers? Where are the file servers? Uh, where are the internet hosts? Where are these things? And we want to gather all this information and then actually formulate our attacks. So that's our stealthy submarine there. Uh, we're in San Diego and we're talking about being quiet. I thought the stealthy submarine was uh, appropriate. Um, so. You know, the, these are the three questions, right? So we start off, we say, where am I? And we recon the subnet. We locate the DC. We recon that subnet. So once we find the DC, we do the same thing we do on the subnet that we're currently on, but we do it for the DC subnet. Uh, and then essentially the same thing with um, the different servers, the member servers and the different hosts that we find. So this is just, really the methodology behind being quiet. Um, these are the things that we can, we can locate and the things that we can gather information on to then formulate our further attacks, right? So at this stage in the game, we're not saying, hey, I wanna do uh, SMB relaying, or hey, I wanna run responder, or hey, I wanna do this, hey, I wanna do that. We're just simply doing our recon, we're finding out where we are, where the DC is, and where the member servers are. So there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, these are the common ones that I do. Um, the first thing I always do is I use ARP or I do ARP scan. I find out where am I? So, you know, let me ask you this. How many people here are new to InfoSec or offensive security? Anybody? One, two, couple, nice. How many have been doing it over a year? Okay. So everybody knows what ARP is, right? If I look at ARP, I can say, all right, well, here I am, here's some other computers, here's some other hosts, uh, what are they? The other thing I like to do is ping the broadcast address. So this should not, in a properly configured network, this should not yield any results. This simply shouldn't work, but I still do it. 
Uh, primarily one, maybe the firewall is misconfigured or maybe the devices are misconfigured, right? Who knows? Maybe it'll work. Maybe something will respond. If not, maybe I can get, um, maybe I can get the firewall IP because a lot of times if you do certain things like that in the network, the firewall is the one that pings back, right? Um, but the point is that I, I always think it's, it's fruitful and it's helpful to do this because what it could do, it could help you find legacy or misconfigured hosts, right? So if you get a, if you get a host that pings back from broadcast, well, to me, that's a red flag. So oh, what is this thing? Is, is this something that's been sitting on the network for 10 years that they forgot about? Or is this something new that wasn't properly configured? It's a good way to find, it's, it's, it's a good, it's just a good tactic to throw at the wall and see what sticks because you might get something good back, right? And why not do it while you're there? Uh, some classic things, if anybody's taken the OSCP uh, or has the OSCP, they want to, well, I don't know if they do it in the new one, but when I took the OSCP, they were really big on using the command line to, you know, um, uh, do loops or do ping sweeps, do TCP sweeps with netcat or whatever else, right? Uh, and I've been doing this for a little bit now, and I still use the same technique that I did when I was going for my OSCP. So I will literally just do a bash one liner, you know, with ping and loop through, right? Uh, you can do the same thing in PowerShell. PowerShell has tests. Test dash connection, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can do the same thing in PowerShell. Uh, but the point is that if you do this, <laughs> it's not as easy as just kicking off Nmap or Rumble, right? To be, to be quiet, you need to have patience and you need to be smart in the actions that you take. And so a lot of times when I say, use the one liner to do a ping sweep, people are like, oh, well, why don't you just do Nmap? Why don't you just you know, do SN, turn off post discovery? Do this, do this, do this, right? The point is that when we want to stay quiet, we want to stay simple, right? We don't want to do anything that's excessive. Um, and so I still do those to this day. Um, and it, it continues to work. The last one is that if, if you're able to, um, if you're able to grab a packet capture, I think this is something that we forget about often, uh, that we can do packet captures. We can filter by service, right? Or even if we're not filtering by service, we can filter by port, filter by TCP, UDP. We can see where DNS is. We can see where SMB is going. We can see HTTP, HTTP traffic. We can do all these things. Uh, so that I think that's a, a, a common one that we forget often. So this is really just the first one. If we go back, if we go back to where am I, these are really just things that uh, I'm doing on each subnet when I do one of these, and I'm trying to stay stay quiet like this. So the next thing I want to know is locate the domain controller. Real simple. Uh, nine times out of ten, the first thing I do is I look at the DHCP assigned DNS server. When you're in an Active Directory environment, it's almost always a domain controller. It's not always true, sure but it's almost always the domain controller. So simply looking at the DHCP assigned uh, DNS server, most of the time that's how I figure out where DC is. Um, that's the big one. The other one is use environment variables. So if you're on a Windows machine, you can echo log on server. Uh, the other reason that I say echo log on server <clears throat> and why I say to use, um, so for example, Instead of who am I, if you're on a Windows machine, echo the variable, right? So echo computer name, right? Whatever you're trying to get. Because if you run who am I in a PowerShell or a command line session, EDR is going to see that. Plain and simple. Every single time you do it, you know, carbon black, CrowdStrike, they're all going to do it. And again, we're talking about mature networks. We're talking about mature security programs. If they see you know, Bob from accounting is running who am I? Well, they're gonna know something's, you know, they might not, you know, go crazy, but they're at least gonna investigate what's going on, right? So environment variables are your friend. I use them often uh, to kind of see where I'm at, depending on if I land on a Windows machine or if I'm on a Linux box, it depends. But 
I always look at environment variables. Uh, and again, if you have the pos if you have the option uh, to do a packet capture, I would highly recommend it. So this is more about performing reconnaissance um, and just locating the domain controller. So at this point, we should have a pretty good idea of what subnet we're on, just from the things that we do previously, right? We should have a pretty good idea of what subnet we're on, what else is around us, what type of devices are on the subnet we're on. We're, we should know where the domain controller is, right? And now really what we want to start to look at is um, really starting to look into Active Directory. So once we find the domain controller, you know, so everybody knows what L, what's what's LDAP stand for? It's all right. I had to look it up because I, I always forget the A. It's uh, yeah, lightweight directory access, access protocol. There we go. LDAP, right? Windows Active Directory. Windows is built on LDAP. We often forget this. And by its very nature, LDAP provides certain information. This is how Bloodhound works. Blood, well, Bloodhound does a lot more other stuff. But at its core, Bloodhound is pulling LDAP information from the domain controller. And we can do this ourselves, right? There's, a, there's LDAP search, um, which, you know, if, if anonymous login is um, enabled on the DC, you can literally dump all of LDAP, the whole thing. Right, and you'd be surprised how often that's enabled. Happens all the time, in mature environments. Right, um, anonymous login is enabled, so you can literally dump all of LDAP. And in a minute, I'll show you uh, one of them. But <clears throat> this is the second thing I do. Right, so I find the domain controller. Can I dump LDAP? And I do that. Remember now, LDAP has computer names, usernames, groups, all this stuff. By the very nature of how LDAP works, everything is an object in LDAP. So if you can dump all of LDAP, you're in a pretty good spot. Um, sometimes I'll run Bloodhound, depending on the situation. Um, I love Bloodhound, gives me nice little graphs to take screenshots of to show clients this is what we did uh you know so I, I i do love bloodhound and i use it often uh however if i'm trying to to stay quiet i usually stay away from it and i was actually at the um uh the tool shed where uh they were they were doing a demo of it um and even he said you know even if you're using stealth with bloodhound it's still calling out to each individual computer to get uh I think it's local group policies. I forget exactly, local groups, I think. So it's still calling out to each individual host, right? There might not be like a ton of traffic, but for me, it's more than I want to take the risk of, of creating. So again, if I'm trying to stay quiet, I usually stay away from Bloodhound and just do my best to dump LDAP. So, yeah. So here's an example of dumping LDAP um, using LDAP search. LDAP search was, I don't know, probably made in 1953. Who knows? It's old. Uh, it's been around forever. Um, but uh, here's an example of doing that. So if, if the domain name was Contoso, uh, this is what we would run to dump all of it. Uh, and then I just gave a couple screenshots, but this file is thousands. Yeah, I mean, it's thousands of lines, right? I just grabbed some to show you the header and then show you uh, a group, right? So and remember now, if we dump LDAP, that's one call. One call for all of LDAP. So from a network monitoring perspective, all you're seeing is that one call, that's it. Whereas with Bloodhound, you're seeing call from me to this computer, me to this host, me to this host, blah, 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 blah. With this, we get everything in one call, which is why I prefer to do it. Uh, and this, this provides lots of valuable information. 
it is very core. Again, that you're going to get computer names, you're going to get groups, you're going to get users, you're going to get all that stuff. Uh, in a best case scenario, there might even be um, managed service account passwords there. Uh, if you uh, if you follow Ipsec, uh, he has some pretty good videos on actually dumping this and uh, finding passwords and things like that. But this is a very valuable real resource. That I think as penetration testers, we almost forget about, right? Uh, we almost forget because we say, all right, let's hop in, let's let's run Bloodhound, throw it in there, look at the nice graphs, run our searches, which is great and has value, don't get me wrong. But I think we forget that Active Directory is built on LDAP. We forget. And, and, and there's so much valuable information that can come from this. Uh, so this is almost always one of those things that I do. So if we dump LDAP, Remember, we get, we get uh, uh, machine names and host names. Well, what's stopping us from taking those host names and performing an NS lookup, right? Um, I was about to build a tool, and then I realized, of course, someone did that already. Uh, and so uh, this is a tool called LDAP Domain Dump. The link's there. By the way, the, the, these slides uh, will be, well, I'll throw it in the Discord so you can uh, see all the links and everything. Uh, but essentially what this tool is doing is it's dumping LDAP, it's grabbing the host names, it's performing an NS lookup, right? Um, and so what you can do is you could have an IP list of all the machines, at least in the Active Directory network. Of course, there's gonna be others, uh, but you could get an IP of all the machines, right? Some other random things that I do when I'm performing recon on Active Directory, NetView all should, give you a list of machine names, may or may not work, uh, depending on um, access controls and group policies and stuff like that. Uh, one big thing that I like to do is look at SSL certificates. So if you, if you notice that there's web hosts, um, what I'll almost always do, and I, I personally think SSL, self-signed SSL certificates are an overlooked uh, part of our day-to-day. Our -day. They can provide a lot of information for you if you think about it, right? Um, especially a self-signed. So if you find a self-signed SSL certificate on an internal network, there's lots of things that can tell you. One, if you check the issuer, who's the issuer? Is it some other machine in the AD? Is it local? What is it, right? Um, is it using an IP address? Does that IP address match up with the host that you're on? Or is that IP address some other machine that they, they have somewhere else on the network. Um, but the big thing is, if you check the issuer of that self uh, of that certificate, and you see, well, it's uh, ADC, uh, ADCS-Contoso.com, well, that means that certificate services most likely, this doesn't confirm it, but it means that most likely this is a this uh, internal network, this Active Directory environment, stood up their own certificate authority, and they issue these certificates to their their machines, which indicates that they're using Active Directory certificate services. Um, so that's just one way to uh, to recon Active Directory. It may not show you that they're using certificate services. It might show you uh, it might show you what the device is. So a Cisco self-signed certificate, well, this is a Cisco device. Well, does it say what kind of Cisco device it is in it? Um, self-signed certificates and certificates in general are a great, uh, great place to gather information for us uh, during our reconnaissance. And I think it's overlooked often. Um, I do it all the time and it provides me lots of great in intel. Uh, the other thing, and, and I included this because Looking at that last bullet point, you know, what do you guys think is my number one way of, of popping a shell in an active director environment? Just, just going off that last bullet point. Yeah. All the time. Constantly. Constantly. Um, using NTLM Relay X, that's like the number one way I get a shell in an active director environment. Uh, so I'm always interested to see which hosts uh, have SMB signing enabled and which don't. 
Uh, so which hosts have SMB signing required and which don't? So SMB signing could be enabled but not required. It could be required, et cetera. Um, domain controllers, I think all member servers after, I want to say 2012, have SMB signing required. So you're never going to pop shell on like a DC or a member server using this. Uh, but you are able going to you are going to be able to you know hit other hosts on the environment. So this is one of the this, this is I do this all the time because uh, I can almost always pop a shell. Do you see this a lot in mature environments where they've been pen tested before? <sighs> More than you would think, because it depends on the group policy, right? So you think about like these sysadmins, they have five million ways to do the same thing, right? Um, and it, it, actually, the same thing happens with SSL certificates. So as part of a pen test, when we're done, we run Nessus, we do a volume scan, whatever, right? Um, and and uh, like those Cypher suite issues always come up, like suite 32 and whatever, right? And I'm like, well, wait a second. I fixed that through group policy. Um, because the way that's implemented, sometimes it's a challenge for them to uh, fully execute that group policy. So they think that they did it, but they either didn't have an ACL right or this one little thing wrong. I'm going to go back to uh, the Bloodhound demo today because he showed the uh, the permissions and the ACL lists in, in Active Directory, you know, and you can see why it's not a surprise, right? Um, but it, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so again, this is just the third part of, of that methodology methodology that I uh, shared before. Locating member servers, some basic ways to locate these. If we dumped LDAP, look at the OUs, uh, the organizational units. Uh, they usually give you a lot of information. Uh, Sysfall. If you're not looking through Sysfall, you should. Um, you know, back in the day, it used to be real easy to get a C password from some XML file in Sysfall. Uh, and I guess maybe that's what kind of ingrained this, this process into me because I used to always find C passwords. Um, but I like to look in the scripts folder uh, and see what network drives are being mapped. And that'll give you a lot of intel into the file servers that they're using um, and anything uh, related to it. The other one is I like to look at the GPO that sets the, the web bookmarks um, because this will, of course, show you internet websites, uh, you know, other hosts of interest. Um, but just by doing the things that we've done so far, we should have a pretty good, um, we should have a pretty good idea of, of what we can do and what sort of attacks we can, we can perform. So just a little bit quick on lateral movement. Of course, I don't think I have to say it, avoid Mimi cats, but I said it anyways. Uh, a common thing I do is use proc dump to uh, actually dump LSAS. This could become a challenge uh, depending on protected memory, depending on the EDR that they're using. You know, this might be easier said than done in certain situations. Um, but uh, the point I'm trying to make there is stay away from the tool and, and do the process instead. Uh, the other big thing I like to look for is group managed service accounts. So if you're able to locate those by nature, Active Directory provides those uh, to you um, if you're in the group. Um, and this is something that might not necessarily raise red flags from an EDR or network monitoring perspective because you're doing legitimate actions as far as Active Directory is concerned. And then just one quick uh, uh, low bin to throw in there. Uh, one that I like to use is RPC ping. Um, so if you pop the shell on a Windows machine, you don't know the password, uh, you can actually use RPC ping to, um, to send a request to your attacking machine. And in that request, if you just open up Netcat and wait for the connection to come in, you'll actually see the NTLM v2 hash. Um, so it's a good way to grab an NTLM v2 hash if, if you're not sure where you are. Um, some basic stuff about working with C2s. Um, and these are typically what we do. Um, 
We, if at all possible, use MTLS on 443. Uh, so uh, Sliver is, is one of the big ones that we like to use. Uh, and that's kind of the de facto standard with Sliver's MTLS. Um, the other one that I like to talk about is SSL tunnel or S tunnel. Um, so you can actually create your own SSL tunnels, right? I did a talk for Red Team Village a couple months back where I talked about routing SSH traffic through an SSL tunnel, right? And so the reason for this is, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, uh, SSH is encrypt then MAC cryptography, which means that from a deep packet inspection perspective, they can still see, well, this is SSH, right? Whereas SSL is MAC then encrypt, where they can't do the deep packet inspection and they can't see that it's, um, from, from their perspective, from a network monitoring perspective, it just looks like SSL traffic. Uh, but they can actually tell when it's SSH versus SSL, right? Um, and so, you know, depending on the framework that we're using, again, Sliver has MTLS. We like to use PowerShell Empire a lot, uh, simply um, because I love those guys. They do a lot of good work. The guy, BC Security does a lot of good work on Empire. They're always improving it. Uh, so we do like to use uh, Empire. Empire, you know, has HTTP listeners, which you could use certificates with, uh, but you can't use mutual TLS. So like in the case of an Empire payload, if at all possible, depending on the machine, depending on where we are post-exploitation, you know, if we are even able to set up a, an S-Tunnel, um, if, if possible, that's what we'll do. So S-Tunnel literally just says, like much like SOCAT, uh, if you're on the, uh, the client with S-Tunnel, so there's client server, and on s on the client, you say, listen on 8,000 and route it to this IP on 443 through an SSL tunnel. And then on server says 443 incoming, and then you direct it wherever you want. Um, but the point is that you can create a, a, an SSL tunnel, which we do often. Uh, the other one, DNS over HTTPS, but a lot of times, you know, you see organizations and enterprises disabling this. Uh, but if it's there, uh, it's, I've had some really great success. I have one, I, uh, uh, client server architecture that uses D DNS over HTTPS that I wrote in Go, and I've never been detected using that, never. Because, you know, if you think about DNS over HTTPS, what is it? It's really just API calls, that's it. So from a network monitoring perspective, all they see is, okay, this host, uh, Google, or I'm sorry, access uh, Google DNS on this port. That's it, right? But with, by the very nature of DNS or HTTPS, if at all possible, um, you should use it because it's literally just HTTP calls. It's API calls. That's all it is. The DNS client does an API call to the DNS over HTTPS server and gets an API HTTP response back. Uh, so again, that client and server architecture that I built um, never been detected. And I threw IPv6 in there simply because no one knows how it really works. Even if they tell you, they're lying. Uh, firewalls are slow to catch up, uh, even though the vendors might tell you they handle it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that detection with IPv6 isn't nearly as good as with IPv IPv4. That's more of a joke. Um, more than anything, uh, but you know it's it's a good way to to uh, bypass restrictions. It's a good way to um, attempt to hide your traffic from from network monitoring because they really don't. They're getting we're getting better, but it's not that good. So here's just uh, an example attack. I think pretty much um, we talked about a lot of this. So you know an example attack here is. You know, regardless of how we landed on the network, um, first thing we did was run an ARP scan, investigated the ARP table, right? Looked where we were, uh, determined that we were on a client VLAN, um, which is typical and what we would expect to see. Uh, then we checked the primary DNS server, which is, you know, something we, we uh, talked about before. Uh, we did a quick netcat on 88 for Kerberos uh, to see 
if Kerberos was running on this particular DNS server, it was. We said, okay, this is probably the DC. Uh, did a quick ping sweep uh, on that subnet. Quite often, the way network arch uh, networks are architected, if there's a DC, there's most likely a file server, an SQL server, there's other member servers typically in that same subnet. Uh, so knowing that the DC was on that 10.0.0.1, we just did a quick ping sweep um, and discover some other hosts, dumped LDAP, uh, did NTLM SMB relay with NTLM relay, popped a shell, and just got domain creds with uh, proc dump by dumping LSAS. So some things to avoid. I touched on who am I before, Mimi Cats, I shouldn't have said it. Uh, PowerShell. PowerShell used to, I mean, PowerShell Empire was basically built from what well, was a PowerView and then Empire when it originally was built because there was very little detection capabilities for PowerShell back when it was created, back when PowerShell Empire was created. Uh, however, I mean, they can pretty much monitor everything you're doing. If you think about PowerShell, so the thing about PowerShell and C Sharp is they run on CLR, CLR, the common language, wow, common language runtime, right? Uh, which is just an intermediary. So whenever you, whenever you compile a C Sharp application, you're not creating a, a, a real uh, portable executable. You're not creating a real EXE. It says EXE, but it's not. It's an assembly. It's what they call an assembly. And it's basically just a group of instructions that is interpreted by the CLR, which is included on Windows 10, you know, any every major Windows version. Uh, it's just interpreted by the CLR, and then the CLR is the one that's actually running the machine code. Um, so because of that, it's relatively easy for EDR and basic monitoring to, to monitor PowerShell. So anything that you're doing in there, if EDR is enabled, you're probably going to get caught. Uh, one thing I would say is, you know, do your, your recon to see. So if you end up on a machine, look and see where you are. Meaning, are you on John from accounting? Are you on Corey from IT? Are you on John Strand from security? Who are you? Because EDRs nowadays also have behavioral analysis. So if they see a certain person who never runs PowerShell run PowerShell, of course, you're, you know, they're going to pick that up, right? So um, you know, it's really just about um, realizing where you are uh, and, and, and being patient and sticking to the basics. So I can't kind of uh, ran through that very quickly. But the point is that if you just answer these three questions, where am I, where's the DC, where are the member servers, you'll be in a very good position to formulate an attack, which for me, as I mentioned, is almost always SMB relay. But uh, you'll be in a very good position to formulate your own attack. Um, you'll be able to see uh, what different services are running where. Um, and you'll have a much better idea of the Active Directory environment. Remember too, if you, if you dump LDAP and you use that tool that we mentioned before, you'll have a, basically 90% of the network, right, that you got without running Nmap, that you got without running a scanner. Just by that one action alone, you're, you know, leaps ahead of, of where you would normally be by making much more noise, right? So I really thought this was going to take me a lot longer. It didn't. Um, but I think that's it. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Yeah. So you mentioned this check for DMSA is prepared service accounts. What are you looking for in that regard? Is it just to mind for when you prompt them what to target or what? So by the very nature of group managed service accounts, they are managed by a group, right? So if you're if you pop a shell and you have that that user is a part of that group that manages that service account, the G group managed service account password is available to you, right? And you can grab it through PowerShell. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. The, the most common way you see is, uh, I think it's MSDS. I don't remember what it is, but you can actually grab that, that password 
uh, and use it for further attacks, right? So you can grab that password, you store it as a secure blob in a PowerShell variable, and you create a new PowerShell session uh, using that account name and the group managed service account password that you just grabbed, and you can essentially elevate privileges that way and become whatever that account is. So a lot of this related back on the company using AD. Uh, how much of this translates into like Azure AD? Azure AD is just Microsoft's computer instead of theirs. It's, I mean, sure, there's more, there's there's different things like. Uh, impersonating privileges and things like that. But Azure AD is really just AD in the cloud. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, but from an internal penetration testing perspective, it's all pretty much the same. There, there's different PowerShell things that you can do and different um, different properties that you can grab. Right? So it's, but you, you could potentially elevate from the internal network to their Azure admin, right? Depending on how they have credentials and things like that. There's there's certain things that you can do to elevate to Azure, but generally speaking, it's just Active Directory in the cloud for the most part from from an internal pen testing perspective. Why wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I guess so. Sure, but essentially, you got to realize at least nowadays, even mature environments, it's half and half. You know, I mean, they're not fully Azure AD. They're literally just using Active Directory in the cloud yeah. so they don't have to stand up. Or thinking, where is this going to be done? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I have a question regarding to, you mentioned about self-signed SSL. So what are you looking for also in that relation to the ABCS? Can you repeat that again? I didn't get that. What are you, what are you looking for exactly for self-signed? Sure. Uh, I just think they're a valuable tool to gain information about the network, or I should say, I think they're a valuable tool to gain information about the host. Uh, because if you look at it, if it's a self-signed certificate, if you're just looking at an IP that that's that has a web server running on 443 or something, initially you, you don't really know what that is, right? Um, but if you grab that SSL certificate and it's self-signed, say for example, by Cisco, and it says Cisco ASA, Blah 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 blah. Self signed certificate. Well, now you just finger you just uh, fingerprinted that that host just by an SSL certificate, right? And then, as far as AD Active Directory certificate services, so when a enterprise network um, stands up their own certificate authority internally, they use Active Directory certificate services, right? And so what happens is that certificate authority for each host they, that the, the enterprise chooses to create a certificate for, that CA now becomes the issuer to that certificate on that host. So if I'm looking at that certificate on the host and I see it's some other internal machine, well, that, that's the issuer of, the issuer of that certificate. Well, then in my head, I'm thinking, all right, they probably stood up an internal CA. Are they using certificate services? Sure. Yeah. So that's probably so. Usually, I just have a PowerShell or not PowerShell Python. LDAP. What was it? Uh, LDAP. LDAP interchange format. I think it stands for. So it has a particular formatting, like YAML or whatever else. It's a pain in the ass to work with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like there's there's uh, Python packages that you can uh, use that'll help you LDAP parse. There's LDAP three, there's, there's a couple of them. But you can basically pull it, you can basically create any Python script using that package, just open the file and then parse it. And it basically gives you a um, uh, dictionary of the LDAP. So then you can like search the OU or whatever you're looking for. So follow up question, okay, not, not related to this, but uh, reverse DNS, like, or, or DNS before say, quiet or not? <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so yeah, so, so what one of the things I do to find the host on, on the domain, I, I'll do a, like DNS before say against a word list, mm -hmm. and then I'll do like reverse DNS on our student space, and then, you know, script out the you know, host the domain. Like, yeah, you know, they, they tend not to be monitored, but I just want to see what the experience was. Noisy or not, or 
<laughs> yeah. So I usually if I'm doing DNS brute forcing, most of the time I'm looking for subdomains. Is that what you're looking for? Well, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I use Fuzz Faster. I don't know if you ever use that. F F U F Fuzz Faster. <laughs> Fuzz Faster, you fool, is what it's called. Uh, no. Well, I guess it depends because it depends on where that host is. Um, so the common way to, I'm not sure if this is how you do it, but the common way to brute force subdomains is to change the host header when you're sending it to that, that host, right? So you're sending it to google.com, but the host header says subdomain.google.com and you just run through it, right? Uh, so depending on where that host is located and if it's monitored, I'm sure they probably would see it. Um, I guess it depends on how big the list is. Like if you're doing like a million, well, yeah, but if you're doing like a thousand or so, I don't think, I don't think so. I've never gotten busted. So you'd probably get, I bet you get failed to ban before anything. No, really. You know? A question from online. Um, are you familiar with Ping Castle? And if so, would you say that's quiet? Does that fit in these categories here? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure what Ping Castle. Ping Castle. Yeah, I, I believe it's an uh, AD scanner on the same category as Bloodhound. Oh yes. Uh, I've only messed with it once or twice, so I wouldn't really say yes or no. What I would say is keep in mind when you're doing any of those types of reconnaissance like bloodhound, bloodhound or similar it's still calling out so specifically for the local group policies it's still calling out to each individual machine so what i would say is anything that's still looking for the local group policies or has to query each individual machine i would say probably is not quiet yeah i mean i've seen it i maybe that's why i didn't Keep looking at it because. Yeah, like in place of like uh, Bloodhound Enterprise or something. Like, are they mapping it out? Well, it, it does a lot of stuff. It gives you basically a kind of a, a sort of like a lot of different things and configurations of like things in through your security. I think yeah. you know, like it's 70% of the way there and like half of the time or Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing it, but honestly, I never looked into it and maybe that was why. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So you're talking about looking at group policy and uh, you usually use a graphical flow for that or using SMB client to like look at syscall and look for something like that? So yeah, it depends where <laughs> honestly most of the time I just mount syscall. If I have creds, domain creds, I'll usually just mount it. Um and just poke around. Do you find I still look for C passwords because it's 1998, I guess. Uh, but uh, I just mount. I literally mount it. If I'm if I'm if I'm on a, a Linux machine that's not domain joined, I'll just mount it and look through. If I'm on a domain joined one, I will literally go to Windows Explorer and just click around because I'm afraid, and I've been caught by running a find in the command line by EDR. Carbon Black and CrowdStrike are pain in the ass. Right, and so anytime I can do something manually, I'm going to do it that way. What have you seen uh, as far as security controls that might frustrate your methodology? Firewalls, for one. Oh, firewalls. Yeah. Um, well, and remember, so oh, at least what I talked about today, a lot of it relied on ping sweep. So what if they turn off ICMP, right? Well, then it gets a little bit more complicated, right? Um, so then I would think, well, what's a common port that should be open? So instead of a ping sweep, I'll literally do just a quick netcat on port um, like SMB or something, something that I think would almost always be open on that particular host or in host and active directory, if there's a port that I know will most likely be open, instead of doing a ping sweep, I'll just sweep each host for that port to see if it's open, usually just using netcat or something similar. Uh, but that's usually the biggest one. And then the firewalls, Cisco ASAs seem to always um, cause a lot of issues with stuff like that, because the ASA 
is almost always there's always I've come across a lot of ASAs that I did not like and not necessarily because they were stopping what I was doing, but because what they they weren't doing what they're supposed to do well. Right. So meaning if I did like a broadcast, I shouldn't either I should either get like a couple pings back from the firewall or nothing. Or if there's a vulnerable host, that would ping back too. But the point is that Cisco just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps sending them, sending them, sending them, sending them. And it never stops. So like even if you did like slash 24, it just keeps flooding you because it's it doesn't know. Like it's not, I don't know what else to say. It's not, it's not engineered well. And so it doesn't realize that okay, I need to stop doing this and it just keeps doing it. Actually, there's been a number of times where we've had to make sure that we did full TCP scans, not SIN scans, full TCP scans on like a vulnerability assessment before because the ASA couldn't handle the half open connections, right? And we're talking about firewalls and security appliances that are, you know, they're not old. I mean, there's some that are old, but they should be able to handle a SIN scan, no problem, but they don't. Um, and so really the, the only time I've, gotten angry or frustrated was usually when there's an ASA there just because it's misconfigured or it just doesn't work right. Cool. Good. I think that's it. Thanks.